we want to develop a platform such that we have the capabilities both to launch uh, launch games, scale games, uh, maintain those games uh, from an acquisition standpoint, and obviously monetize them as efficiently as possible. EdTech is the price that we pay for free YouTube, email, apps, games, web search. But it's been in upheaval over the last year. We've seen multiple billion dollar acquisitions and maybe more M&A than in the previous decade. That includes ad networks bought by gaming companies, gaming companies bought by ad networks. What's happening and why and how are we changing the landscape of technology? To learn more about that, we're chatting with Rich Izzo, the CEO of Chartboost, and Scott Koenigsberg, the Chief Product Officer at Zynga. Welcome, both of you. Thanks, John. Thanks for having us here today. Yeah, thanks. Hey, su super happy to have you. Zynga bought an ad network for $250 million. I mean, a decade ago, that would have sounded insane. Why'd you do it? It's, you know, it's a good question. I think one of the things that drove us to uh, do this acquisition was we were looking for ways to take more control um, over our ability to monetize players and our ability to acquire players. Uh, Zynga has one of the largest um, ad inventories in mobile gaming. And it's a very diverse set of uh, inventory across many different games. And, you know, we pride ourselves on having an uh, ad eligible audience uh, and providing that ability uh, for our players, both to monetize and progress. And it's, a, you know, we see ad monetization as a way to retain players in our games. We also, you know, we're looking to vertically integrate into these channels where quite honestly, there is a loss of kind of data. Uh, and obviously there, there's a lot of dollars that get taken along the way by, by intermediaries. And so we're looking for opportunities to vertically integrate. Uh, to get these efficiencies to create a better market for ourselves on both the user acquisition and ad monetization side. And so we started looking at companies out there who already were at scale and already had a proven track record and ability to do this. And quite honestly, it was, it's not a very long list. Um, and then, you know, the other pieces, of course, we wanted to work with the team that fit culturally into Zynga. And that's one of the, you know, in our, in our you know, M&A uh, uh, history, I think one of the most important things that most important success factors is finding teams that fit well with, with Zynga and work in the same way. Um, and when we met the team at, at Chartboost and kind of looked at their reach and their scale and, and what they'd already accomplished, they kind of checked all the boxes. They had, you know, the ability to help us monetize better in our own inventory. Um, they had a large SDK reach and they were going to help us be able to buy more efficiently through their DSP. And so it was sort of, you know, it fit all, the, it checked all the boxes, did everything we needed. And then when we met Rich and the rest of the team, it was like, you know, honestly, you know, two or three weeks into working together, it was kind of like we'd been working together for a year or two. <laughs> Rich, let's bring you in here. It's kind of interesting because Scott mentioned the phrase vertical integration, right? And um, that's something that uh, we, we've seen an explosion in ad tech. We've been, seen an explosion into these tiny little slices of functionality, right? There's, there's an alphabet soup of different components and pieces of the ad tech puzzle. Is this kind of a reaction to that or is it, is something else happening here? I think it's in part a little bit of both. I think, you know, there's this notion that in order to continue to play at scale, you need to have a lot of these pieces that folks are mentioning. You need to be able to control your own destiny. I think Scotty said a lot of these things really well. Uh, the more you can control, you know, your user acquisition, your ad monetization, and, you know, really provide services to support not only your own content and users, but additionally, the third party aspects, those things are, are key and critical, I think, to growth and scale. This, this notion of a software platform is what uh, I think we're driving toward as well. And I think you're seeing this in the space a lot. A lot of the big players are using that terminology and building toward it as well. And, and Zynga's, you know, uh, no different in a, in a sense. So um, that's what we're headed toward and that's what we're driving toward. And that's, you know, in part the trend that, um, you know, exists today that we're, you know, we're following through with. And I think let's dive in. in, in as, Go ahead, Scott. In, in mobile gaming in particular, you know, a lot of what we do is, is data driven, right? We, we experiment our games we make decisions for, to optimize on different metrics. And it's no different in ad monetization or user acquisition. You need a very robust decisioning engine um, and that's become more important than ever. And so with our ability to kind of combine our first party game and demo data with Chartboost's ability to their algorithms to monetize and acquire users, that seemed like a very natural fit. And I think that's why you're also seeing a lot of the vertical integration. It's about having more visibility into the data to make better decisions. 
What else is behind this? Obviously, there's a lot going on in terms of privacy. There's a lot of change that happened with iOS, although maybe not as much change. We've noticed in the last little bit with Apple backing back on some of its privacy uh, restrictions, perhaps in private. Uh, what else is driving this? Can you go a little deeper there? Rich, you want to take that or? Yeah, I mean, I think, John, you're asking really good questions. Uh, with respect to privacy, I, this is a challenge that has, it's almost like the gauntlet has been thrown by Apple to everyone in this space. Google's following suit. There will be a lot of trends. I think for every company that participates in ad tech now, you want to be privacy forward. You want to be building towards solutions that are privacy forward. And, and Scotty really hit the nail on the head. I mean, having this consolidation of first party data and a number of tools to help you know, uh, deploy that data in meaningful ways. And again, you know, uh, data that Zynga owns and, and users are opted into. And again, in thinking in terms of privacy forward, how we manage that data and utilize it to do this user acquisition, to do monetization, to potentially do other, um, provide other services and, and tools as well. Um, I think that's, you know, that's what we'll be doing. Yeah. Talk a little bit about um, the merger here. You. You mentioned that, hey, they work really well together. You guys kind of bonded really, really quickly. How does having Zynga make Chart Boost better? Scotty, you want me to take that one? If yeah, that's, that's, take that one. I'll, I'll take I one. definitely want you to take that one. And then yeah. I'll ask Scott the opposite question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so there, there's a number of things. I think the fir first and foremost, there, there's a couple of things. I'll take the philosophical first, like, and Scotty touched on this as well. I mean, he said a lot of things quite well. We, um, we have a very similar philosophy, a very collaborative nature. And I could tell that from the very first few phone calls that I had with Scotty, other members of his team, Alex, Frank, et cetera. So it was great to get to know everybody and, and you know, just get an understanding of like what it is that they want to do in the space. Um, from a, how, you know, does Zynga really benefit Charpoost? It's, it's really about, like, I would say a couple of things. One, there's investment. Um, they're very keen on, you know, investing in our platform so that we can serve not only Zynga, but third parties as well. Um, and I think that that's core and critical, and that will be, you know, very meaningful to our success. The other piece about this is in large part, the, the data, you know, the, the first party data that they have as being one of the, you know, arguably one of the largest developers in the world. You know, our plan is to, again, you know, be very sensitive with that and use it properly, but to continue to help them, uh, you know, scale and acquire users. And in essence, you know, uh, it, it seems simple, right? We say we talk about doing user acquisition. We talk about doing ad monetization. And, and, and even more simplistic, I guess, is this notion of creating a flywheel where we're not only continuing to, you know, keep their users engaged in their own ecosystem, but continuing to find new ones outside of that that we can bring into the ecosystem you know, through our combined efforts. So it's probably the simplest and easiest way to describe it. Yeah, that's the real benefit. This episode is sponsored by Dollar Smart, my creator coin. Yeah, it's crypto. No, it's not a scam. Buy some to support the show, sponsor the show, get weekly rewards as the coin grows, or just to be part of the community at rally.io slash creator slash SMRT. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I'll bring in Scott here because, of course, if you're Zynga, you have, what, over 4 billion installs, downloads of your games. Um, it's probably an out-of-date number. It's probably bigger than that now. So you've got a lot of in-game data of what people do, how they act, if they buy something, how long they spend, all that stuff. If you're Chart Boost, you have a lot of visibility into this very arcane and little seen world of ad tech, especially mobile ad tech, where auctions are happening millions of times a second, um, you know, bids, impressions, uh, costs, different users, now a lot of context as well, uh, fewer identifiers or unique uh, universal identifiers for devices. How does putting those two data sets make Zynga better? So it's, it's a great question. And, and it's, you know, it's funny because as we look at the, we have a very sophisticated, uh, ad stack, right. And, and we have, we actually built our own ad server. And, you know, as I said, we have one of the largest inventories in mobile gaming. It's very diverse. We have banners, we have interstitials, we have reworked video. And so we have, we've been doing this for a long time and we have, you know, one of the more sophisticated waterfalls, I think of anyone in the market. And it's sometimes, you know, it, and it's, where we, you know, we take a lot of pride in that. It's, it's a large part of our business. Um, 
but we've never seen kind of the underbelly, like you said, of, of kind of what really happens in the background because we were simply a customer. And so we'd be able to learn from Chartboost about kind of what happens in the background and how things are processed. And it'll give us, and if we can combine that data, uh, you know, our first party data and behavioral stuff and contextual stuff with what Chartboost does on the monetization side, we can theoretically get to better ad yields uh, and provide better experiences for, for our players. Um, same thing on the, you know, the monetization or the user acquisition side. You know, we buy through a lot of third parties, but we've never had the ability to really hone the algorithms for exactly what we wanted to because they're other people's algorithms. Now we actually have the ability to use our, you know, machine learning and, and data science capabilities to work directly with Chartboost and their teams to say, okay, this is the type of user we want to acquire and this behaviors we look for. And by the way, this is how they may or may not act in our game. And then we're looking for more of these people or a diverse set. And so it gives us a lot more capabilities. One of the hardest things, you know, in mobile gaming is uh, user acquisition and scaling your game. So mm -hmm. it really does provide Zynga an opportunity to take some of the risk out of that and be much more efficient as, as we launch those games and also retain and retarget our players. Part of that efficiency I'm, I'm thinking has got to be cost because uh, it's different in different areas, but there's been some looks at what percentage of each dollar that's invested into ad tech actually goes to buying the media, buying right. the time in front of somebody's eyeballs, right? And there's been some really nasty, awful, horrible studies that look at that where, you know, it's like 20 cents, 30 cents, 50 cents, maybe if on, on the high side. And a lot of other, there's five cents here for that slice of ad tech and there's 10 cents for that slice. And there's, and so you're seeing, Hey, I, as a publisher, am spending a certain amount to get in front of somebody. Um, and, and ad tech is taking a chunk and the actual person who's hosting the ad, which is a publisher in another sense is, is getting a, a piece. I'm guessing with chart boost, you can make that more efficient and exactly. get more bang for your buck. Exactly. And so our dollars, not only our dollars, but the chart boost third party customers as well, spending through chart boost on say Zynga's inventory, right? There's going to be efficiencies gained by those third parties, as well as what Zynga spends directly through chart boost in the open market. The goal is to maximize the amount of the dollar that goes from me, the advertiser, to the publisher at the end to make the market as efficient as possible so that those people are getting them. And then it also increases the competitiveness of my bids. Yep, excellent. And we won't go into those details, but there's a very nasty lawsuit involving Google right now that uh, is very interesting, actually. I'll probably share that in some other details Ooh, around what percentage they're taking and uh, how that's working. Rich, let's bring you in here. So that's that makes a ton of sense. Are there some downsides to being part of Zynga? Are there some competitive issues? Are there some times where uh, a potential customer may not want to work with you because you uh, are part of Zynga? It's a great question. Um, you know, I, I would say uh, no. <laughs> there are always risks, of course. Like there are always risks that things would, don't turn out the way you want them to, that the integrations don't go as well, that the very cost savings that you know you two are referring to uh, it takes a little bit longer to exploit than you know than we would like it to, et cetera. So there's some risks, of course, but in reality, there there really aren't too many downsides uh, to this at all. And you know, totally transparent, we really didn't experience a whole lot of that uh, post integration and post announcement and, and anything else. I think there was some notion uh, and some questions around it from clients around, hey, how's this going to work? How are you going to operate your business? What does this mean for us? Are you going to keep things separate? And Zynga has been amazing and totally supportive about, hey, you run your third-party business. You keep all that information and data separate. You continue to do that. They've espoused that from the beginning. And, you know, we've loved it. And our, our customers have as well. So it's been, you know, not only a great report with Zynga, but with our customers. And I think just over the years, the way we've operated in the space, the way we've built our agreements, the way we've always touted transparency and trust, People are, they, they get it. I mean, they know us. They've been working with me now for probably too long. You know, I'm probably tired of it. But yeah, they know who we are, I guess. And that's been really helpful. So I don't, you know, again, and just to rot, circle it back around, I just don't see really any downside. I think for the most part, it's up to us to execute. And there's just a tremendous amount of upside here. I'm going to bring in Scott again. And I want to talk about the platforms of the future. Um, we know some of the major platforms, um, even down to the technology side, the iOS, Android, we know some of the major platforms in the space like Google and Facebook and, and others. 
And we see this emerging category that I've called the new titans of ad tech, where we've seen like app love and having been super acquisitive, uh, Unity, a lot of uh, growth. You, Zynga and Chartboost are in that vein as well because you're building towards something. What is that towards? What is that something? What does that look like? What's the, there's no end state here. This is, right. this is business, this is technology, this is the world. We're always evolving. But as you see it right now, what's that next state that you're building towards? What's the entity? What's that look like? Yeah. Um, and it goes back to what Rich said. It's, it is about delivering on that concept of a platform. And so that we want to, we want to develop a platform such that we have the capabilities both to launch, uh, launch games, scale games, uh, maintain those games, uh, from an acquisition standpoint, and obviously monetize them as efficiently as possible. Um, you know, there's a very small portion of users across the ecosystem actually use, uh, purchase, uh, through in-app purchase. And, but there's a much bigger opportunity around ad monetization and what type of ads you serve those players and you want to provide great experiences, right? And so you, you want, we talked about the efficiency of dollars. We talked about getting more transparency of data and, and more access to data along the, the value chain. Um, but at the end of the day, we want to make sure we also provide great experiences to our players. And the more personalized those ads are, and the better we do a job at that, then the better it feels in the game. And there is, you know, we, we recognize that people are trading their time for value. They watch a rewarded video ad, they get a reward in the game. It makes players opt into that experience. And what we found is not only does that obviously increase monetization, but it also increases player retention. It gives them a way to progress without necessarily playing. Maybe it takes longer, but we do. We reward their their time for va with value. Um, and so being able to control that experience from end to end and access all of the data, that's it's th this is a concept of a platform in creating efficient marketplaces and changing the very fragmented uh, ad landscape that exists today. I love that you mentioned rewarded ads. I was chatting with uh, somebody in the industry uh, just yes, two days ago, actually. And both of us, uh, there's a certain game that we play that we have in common. And both of us are fairly well-paid people who work in the tech industry. If we wanted to, we could buy pretty much everything in the game. <laughs> right, And we don't because yeah. it feels like cheating, right? So yeah. yes, you watch the rewarded ad and you give it your 30 seconds, your 45 seconds of attention, and then you get your gym or you get your power up or you get your whatever. Um, it's interesting how this it, industry it, it, is. It, it, it feels if the rewards are right and the experiences are right, it feels good. Uh, and you feel like you, you're trading your time. And, you know, when you watch an ad on TV, you don't, nobody's paying you for that. In our games, we are we are compensating you for the thirty seconds you gave us to watch that ad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, maybe one more for you, Scott. Are you planning to still be acquisitive? Are you looking for other components, pieces to fit into this uh, puzzle, this platform of the future? Yeah, I, I think as you said, it's a very it's an ever evolving landscape, and we have an idea of what the end game, uh, the end state looks like. But it's going to change. This this is a rapidly evolving space. It's changed dramatically just over the last year. Um, not only through what's happened from the the, um, the vertical integration front, but also privacy changes, also tools that changes the tools and the landscape that you need to be successful. So um, I think the answer is yes. We're always looking for opportunities um, as to how we grow our platform and what are the you know we're kind of looking forward. What are the future needs that we'll need for the platform? What are the current needs? And then what can you know we obviously build ourselves. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is yes. We're always, we're always looking. <laughs> Excellent. You mentioned this end state. I mean, I, I'm, I'm curious, what is this end state that you envision? Um, you know, I think it, it so again, it, it goes back to that platform that I spoke of where we have full visibility and control over the experiences that we're providing our players and we're not necessarily beholden on uh, third parties for, for success. Um, now Zynga is at a, most of the companies we're talking about are at such a scale that nobody's ever going to fulfill all of our ad, ad inventory, it's just not possible. And we're never gonna be able to acquire our players. But if we can do better and we can make, and our dollars can get to the publishers faster, I think the end state is where every dollar is getting that much more further to the publisher, and we're getting more of the quality users that we want at the right price. That is a really big statement actually. And that goes beyond user acquisition and monetization. That actually goes into some of the territory that you might have with an Epic Games or something like that with certain lawsuits around uh, the app store and monetization and where it can happen. We're not gonna dive too deep into those, but that is an interesting statement. And I think that any gaming company 
any publisher of size is bound and beholden to do that because anything that has existential power or control over your right to be, to exist and to compete uh, is a potential threat. Very, very interesting. Rich, let's bring you back in for half a moment. You've been in ad tech for, you know, it's maybe it's been two years, maybe three. I'm joking. It's been a while, right? It's been a long time. <laughs> what have you seen? And where do you see that uh, it moving towards that end state? I mean, there's been, there's such, there's been such change. We've gone from this ad tech ecosystem of the quite far distant past where you threw money out and and maybe something happened and and maybe you knew what happened and and then we went to this ad tech ecosystem where you know you pretty much had this little um messenger bot that you included with every dollar and 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 you could track almost you know uh, deterministically on on almost every dollar uh what happened and what what what, what that little soldier went and did um, and we're returning to a world in which it's a little less certain and there's going to be multiple different ways of measurement and some are deterministic, but they're not granular and some are just probabilistic um, in, in, in nature. Where, where do you see us moving over the next couple of years? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question. Um, and I think you're going to continue to see a number of things. I think you're going to continue to see consolidation of the fragment, fragmented pieces in the space. Um, that's just going to continue to happen. I think the larger players will will move and acquire pieces, and you're seeing it now. I mean, there's just it's happening. I'm sure there are deals being talked about right now, uh, you know, behind closed doors that will result in even further consolidation. And you also, uh, John, you mentioned something uh, very meaningful about getting precise. I think that's going to continue to happen. People are going to use whatever KPIs, whatever attributes, whatever data, and this, this sort of notion of first party data. The more of it you can get, you know, obviously again privacy compliance and privacy forward, you know, the better position that you'll be in. I, I think there's also a move toward the consolidation of buying power, meaning, you know, the more inventory that you're able to offer to buyers at scale will be really meaningful for that. And, and will make sort of not necessarily a one-stop shop to Scotty's point, but, you know, a really meaningful shop that, you know, folks in the space that are looking to do user acquisition need to stop into and, and uh, participate. And also, and also brand. I mean, brand needs to be unlocked inside the mobile landscape that, that really hasn't been done in a meaningful way. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to look to obviously, you know, contribute to that and provide opportunities there as well. Uh, but the space is headed in that direction. There's no question. Um, yeah, and I think, I think that sums up pretty much everything. There will be no shortage of, of, I think, consolidation, but there's also a lot of opportunity for innovation, some blue ocean right. things and there's also, I mean, there's blockchain, there's NFT. We, you know, we can go on <laughs> for for quite a while, but yeah, there's a there's a lot there. Yeah, this is the world of technology. This is the world of mobile. Uh, it is constantly changing. I'll bring you, Scott, back in, and this is actually a great segue because, of course, we do have Web three, we do have crypto, we do have NFTs, we have this world of collectibles inside apps, which is potentially changing a very significant amount of what we do. We also have this sense that we're we've got an impending phase shift. We've had the the phase shift from desktop to mobile, right? A decade, fifteen years ago. That's really complete, basically, right now, as, as much as you can say something is complete, right? Uh, and that privileged some platforms and some networks, and it deprioritized some other ones, right? Uh, what's the next one? We keep hearing metaverse, metaverse. We got this Web3 crypto stuff that Rich just brought up as well. You know, what do you see the next sort of phase shift as? Uh, what kind of timetable do you assign to that? And how's that going to work into what Zynga does? I give you the, I'm just giving you the easy questions here, Scott. Oh, that, yeah, good. I mean, that's that's it. Nothing Let me, tough. Let me <laughs> that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's something that we do obviously think about. Our goal at Zynga has always been to bring our games to wherever players are. And so, you know, we've launched games now on Snapchat, on Amazon Alexa, on uh, Google Nest Hub, on uh, TikTok, on Facebook Instant. If you remember way back, there was a short blip where there was a, a store on iMessage uh, where we had a, yes. our own game. And so we generally look at the ecosystem as we want to bring our games to wherever the players are. I think the metaverse is is quite interesting. And and there's, you know, there's the Roblox metaverse and then there's, you know, Facebook um working in kind of AR, like two different, very exper two different experiences, uh, both big opportunities for for games, I think, in the long run. Um for us, it's about bringing games to wherever our players are. So we are, you know, we're gonna evaluate all those experiences and prioritize accordingly with all the other things that we have going on. 
we just we recently announced that we were bringing you know our, uh, a game to uh, PC and console. Um, and so, and then we also announced that we're going into blockchain gaming. Um, so we are evaluating all these and, and blockchain gaming is, is something that's very new. It's very, very early days, but, you know, I think we do have, you know, the opportunity, uh, to potentially do something there with the, the current landscape and some of the IPs that we have available that might lend itself well, uh, to that kind of gaming experience. That's really interesting. And actually it's quite intriguing as a larger studio as Zynga is with many different properties, because you've got small M metaverse, you've got large M metaverse, and it's been, uh, for, for over a decade now, much more than that, probably that, that gaming studios have said, Hey, we're going to cross promote what we have. Well, you can have a mini metaverse, a Zynga metaverse, you know, with doors and portals in, in a Zynga game or app to another Zynga experience or gamer app or something like that as well right so there's lots of different ways that you can start building those doors and entryways and then maybe cross pollinate across right. it's going to be an interesting world uh i look forward to seeing it yeah it, and it already you know it already has been with the success of some cross play games where people are playing on a console and then moving to a mobile device and, and playing against mobile players it, like it's really it is an interesting world and i think we're seeing um that it that a lot of these experiences shouldn't be device specific, but rather you bring them to anyone, no matter where they're playing. And so that, that'll be our goal at the end of the day. Not all experiences will lend itself to, you know, a ro an experience in Roblox, for example, might not lend itself well uh, to a mobile game. Different, but we're going to develop games that are bespoke for the platforms. That's the most important thing. So there are games feel native to the platforms that they're on. They don't feel like they're ports. So we will evaluate all of it. You know, it's exciting. Uh, time for us as we see the evolution, because there hasn't been that much evolution over really the last uh, year or two. So it's, it's really yeah. an exciting time to be in, in gaming. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you, Scott. I want to thank you, Rich. This has been very interesting. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, John. Appreciate it. Great to meet you.